so I just as soon as we can get the document up there I'll show you what we're gonna do but we're gonna spend um, I have a list of questions that I want you guys to discuss in small groups maybe we'll just divide this group in half and can someone do um, breakout groups for yeah yeah okay so and uh, maybe we'll let's let's divide people like in fours oh, fours okay and what we're going to do is we're going to have a 15-minute conversation in small groups answering a, a bunch of questions and then I'm gonna give a little talk in response to, to this whole thing and then we're going to do the same and then we'll um, have um, well actually we'll have some responses from the the small groups to hear what you guys thought all together and then we're going to do another small group series with other questions okay and then we're really just talking about um, really the whole uh, weekend the theme has been how do we create Jewish ecological culture um, as opposed to let's say just you know, a tikkun olam committee that's doing some specific environmental actions. How do how do we integrate um, ecological ideas into into our Jewish culture? So the this first part, we're just going to be talking about language, and this has to do with the question that came up last night, right? And uh, just the whole thing about the the question of. Um, in, in academia, there's a field called religion and ecology. Why isn't it called religion and environmental studies? I mean, religion and environmental justice, right? Um, so what I want to start with before, you know, my saying anything about this, I have three uh, questions for you. And um, I want to take 15 minutes. And we'll just, we'll divide up in half. And the questions are, how do you think about yourself in response to nature? And all the questions are up here. And these are just different words, okay? And none of them maybe feel suitable to you, but come up with others. And I wanna know what terms you use and what, they, what the words mean to you. And then are there any of these terms that are off-putting to you, that are like kind of, that you might f even f notice a little bit of reaction or a big reaction? To any of the terms, um, and if 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 it is off-putting, just try to put some words to what's off-putting about it. Okay, and again, what this is all leading to is about how we communicate the environmental message, um, ultimately. So, ready for the rooms? Yeah, we're ready to break out I into. I yeah. wonder if it would be useful. I don't know if this is easy to do or not, Barb. I wonder if you could copy just that list of words and paste them into the uh, chat, because then I think everybody will be able to see them. Okay. But not once they get into breakout. Not once they get into breakout. Well, they should still have the chat. No, I don't think they do. Um, <laughs> well, if this, oh, okay. oh, I, oh, yeah. It's okay. What about if you do breakout rooms and then do the paste? Does that no, make no, a no, difference? No, no, no. You want to do it before. Oh, you do it before? Yeah. Okay. And the chat will disappear, but if you reopen it, everything should still be there. Okay. So. Okay. Okay, so why don't, one, two, three, four, five. So, like five per group. Okay, guys. <laughs> so we'll take 15 minutes. Let's see what we got here. You can, you want to see, let's see. Here, Barb, you want to just stay and you don't have to move? Well, there is that, right. I want to see you, um, let's see. Yeah, that's how you do it. Turn around. Can I turn this chair around for you? Maybe over here? Here, what about you? Is that, or let's see. Joel has this over here. Is that, is that too close? Is that too close? I just want to start. I definitely want to start. I just want to start. We're trying to. Just trying to get far enough away from the. Why don't we walk over to where Joel is here? Uh, Are you going to participate? Or? I have to. Okay. Oh, sorry. Here we go. <laughs> My chairs. Okay. So I'm going to be on my own. And, you know, if you have questions or anything, just. Okay. I think the off-putting. Could you answer off-putting? 
It's right there. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, you were up on the list of breakout groups and the size of the group. Okay. Uh, uh, you want to see what the list is? Hang on one second. Let me just see what I have. Um, yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, can you give us the list of words? Sure. I could also. Okay. I'll just. Oh, oh go ahead. Okay, okay, so here's the list of words. Steward. Concert. You listening? Steward, concert. Can you send it to me? I've got my phone. Maybe, oh, you have it on your phone? Maybe, um, oh, what about, you have it on your phone. Do you get email on your phone? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I do. I've closed it on my computer and it's oh. still showing, so oh, okay. apparently I can't. Um, oh. Steve, and Steve and Alan, you have it. I sent it to oh. you this morning. Can you just send oh, it to okay. those guys? Uh, maybe in both groups, if you could send each person. But 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 the language is is things like steward, environmentalist, conservationist, preservationist, um, nature lover, outdoorsy, and I can't eco Jew. Close the should I try to do it, Barb? Environmental okay? justice advocate, animal oh, rights return, advocate. Just, um, they, they then all come back. Oh. So you pull them out of the breakout. Oh, so I shouldn't close that. Right. Okay. All right. Let's see. It won't let me. Trying to, I was going to try and copy and paste you know, the list, but it's not really working. You know, I mean, I've always been supportive. I think I've never looked at myself in any of those. I mean, outdoors. You know, outdoors really doesn't, doesn't fit, you know, in what you're saying. But I guess, you know, I, I guess you could say whatever it is, I'm an environmentalist, but it's not like I, I fully support it, but I have to say, I.
So I would love to learn more about what that what that orientation is. Give the breakout rooms. Yeah, I'm going to, let's say. So we're going to finish up in a minute, and then we're, we're going to come back and, and have reports to be true. How true it is. Because yes. it doesn't encompass, for well, most people, that is a good word that's going to make people think. They're going to think, well, I think it's about trees and rivers and oceans, and not all of them about all of them. Right, but right, I'm just saying. I have a clue. 
say it's video because I figured it's a thing. No, and I think it's a thing. Oh, okay. Okay, guys, can we come on back? So only some of them are back, is that right? Because there were, it seemed like there were, yeah. Okay. Great. So tell me when they're back. They're all back. Okay. Um, great. So I'd love to spend a little time uh, having each group report back um, some of the themes, okay, that, that came up in, in your groups. Um, again, so. I'm um, really interested in the language that resonated for people, how, how you think of yourself in relationship to the natural world, what language is meaningful to you, what, what language might you have a negative reaction to or could imagine other people would have a negative reaction to. Um, so um, who wants to start? Does somebody, one of the groups online want to begin? Can I volunteer us, Kevin and Susan and Leah? Yeah. Go okay. for it. And you guys should pitch in because I will forget some things that we talked about. Um, uh, we didn't really talk much about negatives at all. We were talking about the fact that all of our identities as we saw them were not on the list. <laughs> so we added to the list and um, well, I guess um, some folks said environmentalists probably came the closest, but um, a good environmental citizen should have been on the list. Um, there's no should have. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, energy, I think, people are putting into recycling carefully and well and um, thinking about their purchases and so on. Um, and then we talked a little bit about our backgrounds as urban versus outdoorsy. And um, uh, I, in my case, I added community planner to the list because it's all about, which is what I do. And it's for me, I came at it from an environmental direction. So it's about you can't get to environmental solutions without um, working with the people and helping to change their relationship to the environment and their bonds with the environment. And that includes their urban environment that they live in. Um, and then I also added sister and brother and relative and grandchild to it because growing up camping and hiking and canoeing and backpacking with my family, um, I think I have, I feel a very strong bond with the trees and the rocks and so on when I'm in the woods, I always have, it's that's lifelong, the bears. Um, and um, so I, I do when I, when I'm out there, I think of myself as a sister. Great. So, Thank and you, you very guys have, much. you guys I have anything to add? That was very comprehensive. Thank you. <laughs> and also, um, the point of my list wasn't saying that you have to belong to one of these categories. It's just language that's out there in the field that, that people use. And what I'm trying to show is the difficulty of language, actually. So I'm very happy to hear what you have to say, because it makes total sense to me. OK, uh, let's have one of the groups from here. 
and maybe we could get. I can stretch uh, this mic a little bit. Okay, but. I'm sort of a, a oh. group of one okay. um, since I'm on <laughs> the host, but I could eavesdrop a little bit what was going on. Um, this is Barb, and um, I, my family comes from a long line of farmers, and so they always composted because you didn't, you know, you just composted because that's what you did. Um, and it wasn't until I started living in places like Boston and Milwaukee and Cleveland that, well, I still composted, even though I found out later that it was illegal. Um, but some of those terms are, as a scientist who's worked with animals, you know, animal rights advocate is a very tough subject uh, for somebody who's in the sciences because so much of our science is, requires the use of animals. And, and you have to treat them humanely, otherwise it's not going to work. Um, so that's, that's my piece. Great. Okay, um, actually let's have the, one of the other groups here. Do you all mind? Yeah. Yeah, I'm that I want to talk. Here, I'll just, <laughs> I'll just hold this up. Or you can, either way. Yeah. Okay, I'll sit on your lap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is Maxine. So in our group, I was, we were trying to look at what uh, Rabbi Ellen was describing as eco, which isn't just nature. So we said we didn't really like the word nature because it didn't describe everything we're all talking about the trees and you know and the different things and for me as i said i was a um you know kind of an ecological virgin because i really wasn't aware of the um the myriad of elements coming into the ecology so we tried to find, I, you know, I thought, let's think, think of a new word that isn't being used that maybe would provide that understanding of it's more than just the rivers and the trees and, you know, et cetera. And what I came up with was a creation sustainer. Okay, so that's, that's terrific. Um, does anyone else from the group want to add anything or does that? Well, because, no, no. because what, okay, one of the things, you know, ultimately what I want to be looking at here is how different people have reactions to different words, right? So I can't use the language, I can use the language of creation with you guys, but I can't use it in public, in a in secular environment. Okay. Um, just to add a little bit to what... I mean, do people know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You know? That's the world creationists. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so, right? I actually have a talk um, that I gave called... Um, I don't know about... if people on Zoom can hear what you're saying. Oh, yes, okay. they can. Oh, they can? Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, I have a talk that I gave uh, a long time ago about that I... Something about that I do... The Oh, it's called Creation Theology Isn't Creationism. But, you know, if I talk about creation theology, everybody thinks, you know, I'm a creationist. It's the old saying about once you have to define your terms, you've lost. Uh, okay, thank yeah. you. That's, that's exactly the theme of today. Okay. Um, so this is Miriam. Um, part of what we were talking about in our group that uh, Maxine was alluding to is that some of the, t some of the terms uh, can like nature or environment can increase a sense of um, of distance from it that that we're separate from nature, separate from the environment, and um, so I prefer terms like ecology that really emphasize the whole system and that we're part of the system, um, and um, and that that's what led Maxine also to think about creation sustainer. Um, uh, but I I think more of the conversation was focused on critique rather than on like what. Um, well, let's what hear, words would let's be? Hear some of the other critiques, because that's that's what I'm trying to get at. So, if there was other things that came up. Oh, I mean, I, I think I like mostly what I already said about okay. the distance and the separateness. Great, thank you very much. That's that's exactly where I was hoping we'd get. So the uh, negative was you in the, you in the yeah, same group. Okay. 
the negative was like animal rights activist. Right. Um, and uh, somebody said, oh yeah, like uh, angry vegans. And um, so that, um, and, and probably also, you know, that uh, um, the, like they don't, you know, they're so against um, it's re research that's very important for our lives, you know. And so that was a, a, a negative. And then I thought, you know, what's an eco-Jew and what's, e what's an eco-psychologist? Uh -huh. I mean, it sort of sounds kind of woo-hoo. Exactly, thank you. So a lot of, um, I've run into a lot of people that use the language of eco-Jew. And what I really don't like about that is I just feel like, for me, the natural world is as, as big as you could get. It's like really universal and we need to be engaging everyone. And I feel like, you know, the smaller, narrower terms we use, it's like we're creating these individual silos and, you know, you're either part of my group, you're part of this in-group or you're not. And so I never uh, felt very comfortable with the eco-Jew language. Okay, um, another uh, group from from online, from Zoom? Yeah, I can, uh, I can speak for our group. Um, just very quickly, I think what's missing in all of these terms is something that connotes um, a spiritual connection to uh, the environment and to right. nature. And um, so we all felt that that was kind of missing, that there has to be, for us, there had to be, there has to be some sort of spiritual connection whether it's to the trees or the animals or just nature in general, but um, that was kind of missing in these terms. So it's hard to connect any, any one of them. Um, you did, know, you, I, did you have an idea? Did you guys come up with an idea of any language that any specific term that would come up or is any, any I identifier? <laughs> no, we weren't as creative as the other group. We didn't <laughs> create a new term, but um, we all thought that something needed to connote the spiritual connection, but no, I'm sorry, we didn't come up okay, with Okay, no, it's fine. Um, can we have another group from Zoom? Yeah, I'd be happy to share what my group came up with. I had Chip and Nancy in my group. So we talked about how some of the terms were broader than others, particularly the ones toward the end of the list, like um, environmental justice advocate, ecologist, animal rights advocate, whereas ones towards the beginning of the list were more personal, like eco artist, gardener, farmer. Um, I thought the words towards the end of the list were more active at least on maybe a wider national level, particularly the environmental justice advocacy, since we've had so much emphasis on that in our congregation. Um, but Nancy was telling us how she connected more to the gardener farmer term because that's what she does in her own personal time. And, and I agree because that's what I do as well in my personal time, not quite as much the environmental justice advocacy. So it was easier for me to relate to that, even though I felt there might be more of a priority in some of the other terms. Uh, in terms of negatives, we didn't think any of them really had any negative connotations, but we were curious to define the meaning of eco-psychologist. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I learned from Chip that apparently some therapists use that for their clients. <laughs> um so well yeah it is a you know it is a branch of you know you can take classes in eco psychology <laughs> um, is that it on zoom or was there any more was there one more group or no okay great okay and now we have the one more group oh you were done right or do you want to i think nancy wants to add It's um, disappearing. Just a minute. Okay, you can hear me. Yeah. Um, I wanted. To, we also talked about um, issues of equity, and I didn't want to leave that out. The, the uh, international impact, but also local and national impact, um, diff affecting different groups, different countries. Um, 
you know, some people wait. And so often the countries that are doing the most harm are have the least consequences and vice versa. Um, okay. So there's a lot of uh, talk around that. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, last group in, in here. Who wants to speak? Alan, great. You're good. I mean, it'll pick you up. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of beyond what uh, we were talking about in the group. Uh, it's just picking up on what the other Alan said. Um, it feels like this weekend has been about spiritual connection. And so um, that feels like it's, uh, there's all sorts of people already doing uh, environmental or ecological work but um, you know here in our group it feels important to me to have the spiritual aspect involved as a part of it and um, so uh, whatever I don't know what words we could use but um, somehow uh, just Jew doesn't do it and neither does well you know and, and the word spiritual is a, it seems like it's not a bad word. It might have uh, mm. some negative connotations, but I, I, uh, for me, that feels important right at this moment. Great. Okay, well, thank you. I, don't, I just oh. want to check with another couple of people in the group, oh, or if, I, if it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think Joel? I should say a little more. Um, somebody in our group said that all the terms work for him, mm. which I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, I, um, I get nervous when anybody wants to put an I, anybody's having a meeting of people who are anything that ends with IST, I don't want to go to the meeting. Um, and, um, and I would be very disinclined to go to the meeting that had, if it used the word spiritual. Um, and my favorite word was steward. Um, and to me, it's nothing more than, um, I was told, um, to take care of anything that's shared. It's not yours. So so if there's a book shared by our family, my mom would not want us to not not want me to leave it on the floor. And triple so if it's a library book. We were raised you gotta take ex much better care of a library book than a book of your own. So to me the world is just one big library book. <laughs> and we uh, take care of it and it has nothing to do with spirituality it's just being fair to s other users of that resource so uh, is there one more person that was going to speak in this I, I would like to say one thing and and that is our culture is so non-environmentally oriented so um, the, the the common grounds, the concept of the common grounds is actually false. And I read an article about it. And if you haven't read it, I would suggest it and I'll tell you about it. Because what's lacking is a sense of people feeling responsible for something outside of their bubble. And that's, and that's kind of what, I mean, it's such a huge cultural impediment to try and get people to care about something they don't own. Or they, you know, so that's that's my comment. Okay, so um, <laughs> so the the per I, I'm gonna I, I prepared something in response, and I I'm gonna read part of it because we probably don't have enough time. But I I just want to, you to understand where I was coming from, and maybe my questions. Some of you, I feel like, really got what I was trying to get at, which is the environmental communication problem, okay? And what is the language that we're using? I really appreciated what you said. I also am someone who will not go to something if there's an ist at the end. Um, and, um, but, but uh, anyway, so I want to I wanna share this. And it, it's, I just feel like it's really interesting hearing the different responses because how do we speak to everybody about this? To me, that's a major problem. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of my background. Many decades ago, in my 20s, I noticed there seemed to be two distinct types of people that deeply cared about the natural world. However, they expressed that caring in very different ways, 
One type included the river guides and hikers that I knew, people who loved the landscape painters and the music of romantic composers. Perhaps they identified themselves as nature lovers or nothing at all. And the other type included people who were engaged in various campaigns to protect the natural world. They identified themselves as environmentalists. It seemed that too often there was no relationship, no engagement between these two types. They seemed to be speaking different languages. Environmentalists were fighting often against the perpetrators of many injustices, big oil, big coal, big government, the big man, while the nature lovers were preserving lands, restoring forests, rewilding vacant lots, growing gardens, and taking inner, kitty, inner city kids out into nature. While both groups care deeply for the health of our earth, our life support system, they approached the work differently and often there was a lack of communication between the two. I always thought that if these two sides could come together, we would have a much more robust citizenry that could work together to ensure the health of the earth. I figured we could solve our environmental problems. This was like 35 years ago. <laughs> the basic conundrum has always stuck with me. It's kind of a brokenness. Here were two halves of a whole that didn't seem to recognize each other. I always felt in between both types. Early in my ecological journey, I read the work of Aldo Leopold, a forester and poet and perhaps the first American eco-philosopher. In the 1940s, he was speculating that the reason we were beset, this is the 1940s, by so many environmental problems mm. was that we don't have what he called a land ethic, okay? New language, a land ethic. In other words, we humans don't feel a moral responsibility towards the earth and all of her creatures. We don't have any kind of covenant or ethical relationship with the land or the earth in the way that we have, for example, the Ten Commandments to guide our treatment of each other. Leopold used the language of land and land ethic very intentionally. For him, the word land meant much more than the ground upon which we walk. The land is a living organism. We talked all about this last night in the, in the creation, Eretz. Like, what is the meaning of Eretz? It's both earth and land, particularly. Um, land is a community of all life, soil, water, air, plants, animals, and us. While Leopold sketched out a rough picture of what he meant by a land ethic, he believed we needed to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic world, he didn't offer a specific set of guidelines for how to do this. Rather, he wrote essays of his experiences in the natural world, his observations of nature as well as human nature, to try to introduce people to the wonder of it all and to cultivate an appreciation for the natural world. In the language of Abraham Joshua Heschel, Leopold was trying him in his own way to convey a sense of radical amazement. Leopold knew that telling people the right way to behave, telling them what to do and what not to do in relationship to the natural world, would likely be ineffective or could even backfire. He believed that people needed to experience a love for the natural world first before they could be moved to take a land ethic seriously and change their behaviors. We need to learn to love the maple trees and the oaks, the fungi, the pollinators, all the winged creatures, the rivers and the swimming creatures, the earth that generates life and the air that we breathe because love is the energy that can sustain us as we face the enormous lifelong tasks before us. Leopold believed that aesthetics, our embodied experiences, our sense perceptions, our feelings for the natural world would lead organically to ethics. Ethics, he said, don't emerge out of thin air. Ethics develop out of a sensitive, conscious, and thoughtful community. What Leopold deeply understood that many activists do not understand today is that the way that we communicate the environmental message is as important as the message itself. Professional environmentalists understand, and now there's all these programs you can go to, you know, you can get a master's in environmental communication. It's a whole field. Um, they understand that all their good intentions and programs of action for the earth will be for naught if we cannot communicate effectively with our audiences. Even if the content of a message could resonate, if we use a word that strikes a nerve 
or if our audience, so for example, if there's an ist at the end, right, mm -hmm. or an, you know, a spirituality and you don't feel oriented that way, that's too woo-woo for you, it, we can alienate our audiences. Um, there can be a vast gulf between communicator and communicatee. According to a think tank at Columbia University, we need to take care in how we frame the message. Framing can be a subtle art. Even the choice of a single word can make the difference between winning and alienating an audience. And you know, like when I think of this, I think of like national public radio and how, what the, the difference between national public radio and like a commercial radio station is that they're giving us all this context. They're framing whatever they're talking about. They're giving you a, a, a very large frame for you to put your ideas into instead of just saying, you know, this has to be done or that has to be done. I've often felt that the word environmentalist is itself is one such triggering word. For certain audiences, the term environmentalist has a sanctimonious tone and can be divisive, not unifying. Furthermore, as you were saying, um, the word environment, which is fitting when it's used in technical terms for environmental studies, environmental science, environmental jur journalism, may be less helpful if we're trying to cultivate an emotional response in people. The word environment is a generalization, literally it means surroundings. As such, it reduces all the subtleties of nature into an abstraction and cannot convey the beauty, aliveness, warmth, depth, color, texture, smell, memories, and connections of the actual elements of nature like streams, mountains, soil, and thunderstorms. It does not evoke a sense of place. As an abstraction, the term environment tends to distance us from the real world. It draws us away from the embodied world into an intellectual realm, increasing our separation from the earth and sky and weather, rather than connecting us to it. This is exactly the problem we've had ever since Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. Similarly, the word climate is an abstraction. It feels remote and distant compared to wind and rain and heat and drought, which we actually feel. If we're trying to create intimacy and caring for the world, we need an evocative language that can move us to care. The question of language is not just about our personal orientation to the world, it's also political. In America today, for about half the population, those who identify as conservatives, terms like climate change and global warming and environmentalism are politically loaded and can tr trigger negative reactions. It's not that conservatives are not interested in protecting the environment. A 2018 Yale study so showed that conservatives ranked protecting the environment and developing clean energy much higher than global warming, for example, which they, they ranked last. Conservatives associate the language of global warming and climate change with nor northern elites. The language has become so politicized that using it can backfire with certain audience. In the last decades, psychologists have recognized that conservative and liberals are moved by different moral systems and different moral language. And while there is some overlap, there is also distinct differences in language. Conservatives speak the language of sanctity, purity, and order, whereas liberals speak a language of fairness and care. Conservatives are more likely to identify themselves as conservationists who are dedicated to preserving the integrity of God's green earth. They may eschew the language of environmentalism, which may sound to them like a kind of social change program that they identify with liberals. Liberals speak the language of individual rights for everyone. They focus on social justice and environmental justice. In my own search for a vocabulary that can convey our connection to the earth to a
could be seen as biblical. You know, it's where you, that's that's really what we're doing in the Bible is, is where we see the word. What my work has been focused on is really, um, tracing the, the language of, of Eretz and Adamah, also land, throughout the Bible and seeing, you know, what happens when you look at the language of land or earth as universally instead of just in terms of territory in the land of Israel, okay? Um, so I don't know that, you know, we talked about a bunch of other language last night, but just the idea of code, of goodness, that what goodness first means in the Bible is related to all of the creatures, right? Um, again, uh, we, didn't, we didn't talk about the whole notion of, uh, story has the language of the human, the Adam coming out of the Adama. So there's this, this, <laughs> this incredible right. interconnectedness between Adam and Adama. And just that kind of language is also, can also be very helpful. Um, human and humus. Yeah, human and humus, exactly. Um, I just, just again, in, uh, Speaking to Alan about the spiritual dimension, we didn't talk about this last night, but the language in, in Genesis 2 is really interesting. Our job as humans, and we're supposed to, right, some would translate it as to till and tend the earth. The Hebrew is la'avod um, and lishmor, right? And so la'avod often means work, and lishmor means to, like, guard. shamer shavat, right, to guard. But I translate these la avod the way la avod is work, but it's also serve, right? It's serving, like serving in the temple. It's a profoundly spiritual word, and that's a being applied to the land, right? Where where it's like we're serving the land. So I translate these to serve and observe. Okay, so like th that's what our relationship is defined as in Genesis 2. Were you going to say something? I have a question. Sure. Um, I guess they're not. I was going to hear me, but they're not. Um, oh, they are. They can hear. They can hear? Oh, oh. there's two oh. different. Oh, okay. This. Um, you might need to be, not my, you need to be close to the computer. Um, so I'm just curious about so I think everything you're saying um, in terms of what's in the Torah makes sense. And we're, if we're asking this question about communication and how do we communicate with a broad audience, um, I'm wondering if like what your thoughts are about like how Hebrew and like Torah terms, um, how you see them as useful in yeah. a secular yeah. conversation or in yeah. a, a, a country that's, you know, there aren't that many Jews here, right? And 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 there's also the you were talking about creationism and the problem with that type of language also right. earlier. And so, like, how do you well, in a wider audience, how would you find this useful for communication? Okay, so to, to me, it's like I would use the language of, of land, the land ethic. So to me, it's like the so first of all, let me just say that I feel like I live in between a lot of places and I feel like I, I walk this line in between like religious and secular. And it's, it's really important to me to reach a secular audience. And I feel like lots of secular people are really starved for meaning. And um, so, so using Aldo Leopold's language, it makes a lot of sense for me to use it in a public way, but to understand it for myself as, as a Jewish imperative. So that's, that's, and also to share what I know, to share the wisdom of the Bible in the same way that Robin Wall Kimmerer is gonna share the wisdom of her tradition. So to use the language that I have with people and then just explain this, this, is, what, this is what land means to me from the Bible. So I just feel like I'm using English and I'm using terms that other people have used, but I would just explain, you know, like um, sort of the the depth of a word. I would want, you know, you can see I'm very interested in language, so it's like just always wanting to break down a word. Just a second. Yeah, I'm going to just say that. 
sharing that with people. Um, let me just see if I had anything else I wanted to share. Um, all right, I think um, since, okay, it's already 11.05 and I had a whole nother piece that I wanted to do that I also feel is important. So I'm gonna stop with this and we'll, we'll um, can we bring back the, that list of questions and put it up? So we're gonna do, let's, let's do this all as one group, okay? We're gonna have some more questions and I don't have them as soon as you get them on the screen. We'll oh, see. Yeah. Okay, okay, and I'm just gonna read out loud to you. If you're involved in anything ecological from gardens, um, hang, hang on, before I do this, I just need some help in thinking about, should I break the Zoom up into one, its own? Separate, okay. Separated. Okay. Okay. So, so we'll answer questions here and they'll, and the Zoom folks will, will be in their own group. Okay. So there's three questions. If you're in, and this is all about motivation, like what, what motivates you? Uh, because this is another like big issue, like how, we're talking about communication and how do we get people involved, okay? If you're involved in anything ecological from gardens to seed sharing to solar panels to giving sadaka to environmental organizations, what motivates you? If you're not involved, are these the same questions? They're the second set of questions, I can't see. Oh yeah, okay. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry. Let's do this. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, let's do this. Um, is engagement in climate, environment, preservation of natural world a Jewish moral obligation? Why or why not? Where does ecological engagement stand in your own hierarchy of values? Prioritize your values, think of where you give tzedakah. And to me, I really like the second question because it's very specific. Like. Think about where, you know, is this number 10 in your hierarchy of values? Is it number two? Okay, it just will help you think about like where you stand. Um, and, I, and I always feel like giving tzedakah is a really easy way of showing you care, right? And, and so we can just look at that in our, in, our own, in our own selves. And then the last thing is what motivates you to be involved in anything environmental or what stands in the way of your involvement. And, and this includes like things like gardening or, you know, fishing or, you know, just being out, having a relationship with the natural world. What is needed to motivate you? Like, and there's a difference between needing to be motivated in the short term versus needing to be motivated throughout, throughout your life, because this is a lifelong problem. Um, Okay, so to me, um, yeah, just, we'll we'll spend fifteen minutes on on this conversation, and and the guy folks on Zoom will will talk together, and we'll talk together. Okay. okay. Will the uh, think, sound problem be? I think what we'll have to we'll have to check to see if we turn off the volume here, if they can still talk to each other. Oh. Well, put them all in one breakout room. You, I think they should be able to. I can um, do that. Except that it's like you should be able I just did this on a political thing. Hi. Hi, sweetie. Join breakout room.
because there's problems with the climate movement. A lot of people don't feel motivated. This isn't a Jewish thing. Okay, so Jerry Daradas says, the biggest problem that the climate movement faces is that its messaging is really dour and off-putting. You can't eat beef, you can't fly, you can't drive, you can't do this, you can't do that. The dominant framing of the message is negative. People end up feeling alienated if they sense they are being judged on their green purity credentials. Jerry Dardas asserts that the environmental movement is truly a righteous movement. It is right about the facts, right about the warnings, right about the urgency, right about shaming of politicians. However, righteousness is not enough to win people over. And moreover, righteousness can lead to self-righteousness. Somewhere down the line, nowhere got the memo that we need to build a movement that is more joyful, more life-giving, more purpose-driven, more educative, more welcoming, so that even if you don't like the fact that you should practice some restraint, drive an electric vehicle, eat more vegetables, start composting, get rid of your gas, gas leaf blowers, 
you will want to be part of where this movement is going. And this is really tragic because ultimately what we are fighting for is life, the continuation of life on earth. What could be more joyful than that? The fundamental point that Jerry Daradas is making is that we much, must do a better job at outreach. We need to reach people where they are to connect emotionally and psychologically. We need to build a sense of belonging and caring and create a sense of home. So, um, so he asks, how do we champion ideas like defending the planet from the threat of it becoming uninhabitable? How do we do this through joyful, magnanimous, fiery, wel radically welcoming movements? How do we create more joy? How do we create more joy? Holidays. Right? <laughs> I mean, so when I hear the question, you know, I think this is this is it always seemed to me that Jewish tradition most clearly expresses its unmitigated joy through the cycle of holidays. The ancients planted the holidays as nodes of happiness and inspiration that flower at distinct times throughout the year to remind us of who we are and what is important in our lives to help us preserve and live lives that are just and righteous. The rabbis taught that the practice of our weekly holiday Shabbat is what kept Judaism alive for the last 2000 years. In my own Jewish journey, it took me a long time to realize how deeply joyful most of our holidays are, since as a young person, I experienced the holidays as boring, solemn, and mournful occasions. However, once I made the commitment to living Jewishly and engage more deeply with the tradition, I came to see how life-affirming and fun they could be. And perhaps more importantly, I saw how the joy of the holidays was deeply connected to the seasons and the life-giving earth, the joy of rain at its proper time, the joy of the harvest, of the fruits at Sukkot, the barley at Passover, the wheat at Shavuot. Um, and so, so I'm gonna just talk a little bit about, so I feel like in a lot of the work that I've done, and you can see some of this on my website, is, is based in the holidays. Shomri Adama, when it started, the first thing that we did was a major Tubishvat Seder, we held it in one of the boathouses in Philadelphia. 200 people came. It was a huge, like, motivational event. Um, and um, so there's all kinds of work that you can do around Tubishvat. Sukkot is um, Sukkot is Judaism's most ecological holiday. Um, and I just want to read a little bit about. I'll give a shout out to Kirby Bate. He does Rosh every month, and in a major setting. Um, and I'll, I'll give a shout out to Miriam, who's who's uh, Etrog and Lula was uh, encouraged. And, oh great! And, and the Etrog was a bug guy. That's and, great. And and that made me so happy. Because, as you know, I think of, you know people spend this ridiculous amount on etrogs and lulavs, and that it really and they're really not climate friendly. They're not yeah. climate friendly, and uh, it was just intensely made me intensely happy. <laughs> so, so that's that's really great. I want to just let's let's just talk a little bit more about these kind of possibilities. Um, so let's just sticking with Sukkot a little bit, right? I mean, the I the one of one of the uh, um, ideas about Sukkot, right, is you're supposed to go out into nature. You're supposed to go out into the wild and gather these four different kinds of branches, and like and wasn't clear, but even building from the branches that you gather. So just even that kind of experience as a group to be building a Sukkot a sukkah together. From one of the things that's always driven me crazy about Jewish life is um, is how like kid like there's this idea that you're supposed to have these paper chains hanging in the sukkah, and it's like this is a harvest holiday. We have such an opportunity to gather from our gardens and just have naturally grown things. Oh. So so the in the Sukkot I've always had has always been like stuff that I've grown stuff that my neighbors have grown gourds and and everything is entirely natural. Um, and this year um, we did at my synagogue in, in Mount Airy we did a, a week long sukkah fest that was open to the entire public, we had a big article in the newspaper and 
we had events at different people's sukkahs each night of the week. And we brought in different people to talk about different, one person talk about beekeeping. You know, they're just talking about all different topics that had something to do ecologically in, in a different sukkah. And then on Shabbat, um, we were supposed to have jo Joey Weisenberg lead services. Joey's this amazing musician, unfortunately he got COVID the day before, but we had the services outdoors and we, the, and we focused on all the nature, I mean, you've done this. We're focusing on the, all the nature dimensions of the, the liturgy. I mean, it's, it's huge, that, you know, and to do it outside and to have people have that experience with nature as we're reciting the Psalms um, is really potent. And, and then we had a thing at someone else's house on urban agriculture. And then we had a big party at Yoni and uh, Stadland who started Eden Village. Our neighborhood is just full of uh, <laughs> amazing Jews, but, but people like opening their homes up. And, 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 and actually Yoni, he, Yoni, Yoni started Eden Village, Yoni and Vivian, his wife, which is this amazing eco camp that's been going for like 10 years, he left. But he, because I asked him if he'd host, he built a sukkah for the first time. He's huh. been a Jewish professional for, wow. you know, 15 years. So, um, and he loved it, but it's like people need to be asked to do things that they feel like they know how to contribute to, you know? Um, so there's a huge, so Sukkot is a huge possibility. And as some other people were saying online about, um, our ecological stuff that community building and ecology building go hand in hand. And I really believe that deeply. And if we're not doing both together, I, I don't think that we're gonna be effective around the ecological stuff. And that's why I love that, that it can all be integrated into Jewish life. So, um, and again, I have a whole Tu B'Shvat thing on my, um, my website, my Passover Haggadah, right, is, um, e this ecologically oriented Haggadah. And it, there's all kinds of land centric ideas in, in the Haggadah that are authentic to a Haggadah. And th that's a whole other story. If you want me to do a teaching online at some point about the Haggadah, I'm happy to do right. that. Um, you used it, right? I loved it. Yeah. My kids loved it. That's what was exciting. I had, you know, my 30 and 33 year old. Love yeah. Um, okay. And so again, so, so from my perspective, just even doing stuff on, if you did Sukkot, Tu B'Shvat, Passover, that's, that's a significant amount to be like lifting up, like just sort of reminding all the time this ecological message. But Shabbat is an ecological holiday. It's, you know, we're remembering creation. That's the whole point of Shabbat is remembering creation, you know, like what about taking, you know, like walks together as a synagogue on, on, on Shabbat, you know, um, and, you know, it's just so, so there's, and there's this program now called, um, that I've been on the board of called the Green Sabbath program that uh, Jonathan Shore started. And it's all about bringing the notion of a green Sabbath. And this, this goes to your point about how do you talk about Jewish language in a secular environment. Um, so the, the whole idea of the Green Sabbath program is to take one day a week. It's a universal program. It's not just for Jews. It's like one day a week, take a day off and do nothing, have a day of rest and you know do what we do on shabbat be in community you know be outdoors you know do art whatever but don't work you know don't and shop. don't don't shop <laughs> don't, don't shop okay don't drive just be and and so the whole green sabbath program it's you know there are lots of people out there you know there's some people who would be alienated by the language of sabbath but there's lots of people who love the language of sabbath whether they're jewish or not and because the world is starved i mean basically what i what i'm trying to say is that our holidays to me are are is kind of like the greatest gift we have to give the world 
And that's been what I've been doing a lot in my own work is sharing our holidays in the public domain. And, um, and don't be afraid to do that. People are hungry for this. And, and you know, like, I just have so many friends who aren't Jewish, who are amazed at what at the gift that we have that's holidays you know it's we a way of creating joy a way of like upliftment you know um and it's not it's really not hard um it may sound big to you guys but you are already doing all that cool lawyer least program <laughs> <laughs> i mean like just doing stuff that's just more open to a larger audience it's not you know the sukkot program that we did was this huge thing in in Mount Airy, but it was it was probably the easiest program I ever ran because all I had to do was, oh, you want to do it at your house, have a sukkah at your house, and you can talk about you know camping and you know your family's experience, you know, and just finding people and finding it wasn't just Jews who were speaking or just members of our congregation. We just got people to come and speak in the different Sukkot, and then you know just made a calendar and people went to the different sukkahs you know it's really it was very easy uh thing to do um yeah so that's a start and and then for me um the other holiday that i find incredibly profound from an ecological perspective is tisha b'av huh. and um you know like tisha b'av is one of my favorite holidays which is shocking for most people to hear but it's like for me, the destruction of the temple is the destruction of the earth. Uh -huh. That's what's going on right there. It's the destruction of the center of life. And to be able to, I, you know, I don't need a special liturgy. I'm very happy just to use the existing liturgy. It's so hard and it's so real to me. And to be able to offer people a place to grieve and to cry together, I think is another incredible gift that we have. Just like in the, in the way that Shiva is an amazing gift that the Jewish world has that, you know, like all my friends who aren't Jewish are like, wow, this is so valuable. And so I just, you know, this is who I am. I've always like, my orientation is Judaism for the world, that I really feel like th there are parts of our tradition that that everyone could uh, can appreciate because they're hungry for this. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Wow. Can I ask what congregation you belong to? Um, yeah, I belong to Germantown Jewish Center. Okay. Which it's just it's not. I mean, the only the, what's unusual about the congregation is um, what am I looking for? Oh, I have I have some books here. Um, there's a you know there's a Reconstructionist minion there, so there's a lot of Reconstructionist um, rabbis. rabbis and rabbinical students and the head of the college and blah 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 that. So they what was really nice is how supportive they were of what we did, mm -hmm. but they didn't do it until like. I came back to the neighborhood. It was sort of like they weren't going to do it themselves, but once I started, they were right there. So I was like, I served as a catalyst, but I, but they were told I couldn't have done it without them. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add that, like, so I agree with like everything that you said, and there's a whole, um, there's also like a whole field looking at climate grief. Yep. And so, like, tying into what. Rabbi Ellen was just saying about um, Tisha B'Av that like people need to feel their grief in order to to um, get past feeling like paralyzed right. around action. Um, and also, uh, there's a lot of stuff like Adrian Marie Brown wrote like a book on pleasure activism. Like there's right. a lot of stuff out there right now, um, similar to what you were talking about in terms of the need for joy. Right. In, um, and not just a tune, right? Uh, when it comes to motivating action and sustained action, right? Right. When I posed this question at Germantown, a lot of the young people said, when I asked what motivates you, the young people said fear. But I realized, I realized that that's that can motivate you for a short term. Yeah. But I don't think that fear is sustainable for anyone's personal life. 
And that's why the whole joy piece to be able to offer that and to build community as we're building kind of an ecological livelihood feels really important. Yeah, it's great because, uh, you know, I, I, not knocking, I think we did a great thing when we went down to Chase Bank, for example. That's an important thing to raise awareness. But then again, it's, it's uh, on the, what we oppose as opposed right. to what we support. Yeah. Right, right. And I, that's, that's what's, you know, I've always been in the building. For me, tikkun olam, there's another an understanding of tikkun olam, not just fixing the world, but rebuilding the world. And it's like, I just see it as like really proactive and constructive. And so just figuring out, there's so many ways that we can do that as in our tradition. It's just, it just hasn't been available. So again, I'll talk more to you. Yeah. Great. Well, listen, I just want to offer deep gratitude, Rabbi Allen, for, you know, inspiring, thought provoking, um, lots to talk about and chew on and hopefully uh, act on as we uh, move forward. And um, want to, can I, I want to thank our, our planning committee. Um, Alan Fetterman and Audrey and uh, Maureen Dinner and Leah Kamienkowski and Rachel Davidson. Um, and I want to thank uh, the family of Dr. Maureen Hack, Zifron Ali Vracha, who made this possible through their, uh, the fund that they've set up in her memory and uh, really amazing uh, weekend together. And uh, I hope that uh, as a community, we will be able to stay in touch with you. Yeah. And, you know, I love the idea of actually doing an online. Um, uh, session around the Haggadah sure. uh, a little bit further into the year. So um, I think that sounds very exciting. So um, can I say one? More yeah, thing? yeah, yeah. Um, so it's been a total pleasure for me to get to know all of you and thanks for showing up and really, really participating. Um, the best way to help support authors is to buy books uh. and um, and Actually, I'm sorry to say this, but the best way to do it, at least for me, is on Amazon because your numbers, your ratings change and people look at those ratings and also um, just uh, writing reviews. So my Haggadah on Amazon cost $8.97, which is unbelievably ridiculously cheap. Um, so I, I really welcome and encourage you to take a look at that. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to be in touch with anybody. I've just really appreciated getting to hang out with everyone here. Thank you. And I have a few books that I brought with me, if anyone wants to buy any. So. Great, great, very much. Oh, I want to also, I'm sorry, I neglected, I neglected to thank our hosts. Um, thank you, Maxine and Barb, for hosting us here at Cherry Park. And again, Art for hosting us uh, last night at Acacia.